Today I'm talking to Kevin Snedden with Compass in Manhattan and Greenwich and founder of the private client team at Compass. In his 15 years in the business, Kevin has closed over $750 million in transactions, including record-breaking deals, upwards of $38 million. Among Kevin's accolades, he is ranked by the Wall Street Journal as one of the top 250 brokers in the United States. As many luxury agents, most of Kevin's clients own homes in other parts of the country. Joining Compass, Kevin has harnessed relationships with top agents in other cities to best serve his existing clients and earn new business. Today, we talk about how he does it. Thanks for listening to the Jerry Metcalf podcast, where top real estate agents tell how they do it. This podcast is to share knowledge for realtors and raise awareness for Give Back Homes, where real estate professionals work together for social good. Jet Centers Aviation, Bentley Atlanta, Legends Global, thank you for your sponsorship. All right, everybody, it's the Jerry Metcalf podcast, and today on the show, we are so excited to have Kevin Snedden with Compass. He works in two markets. He's in Greenwich and in Manhattan. Kevin, welcome to the show. Hey, Jerry. Great. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. So this guy's up to big things. He's in two markets and he's. we're going to share a little bit more about some things he's doing to really help clients with big portfolios. But before we do that, tell us just a little bit about and a few records. You've got some pretty record-breaking sales on the on the high end. But before we get into all of that, tell us a little bit about how and why you became a real estate agent in the first place. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I started my career in uh, corporate America. I right out of undergrad, I got a job at American Express and worked my way up the ladder and worked in marketing and business development and finance and. I always had a thing, you know, for real estate. Uh, my dad, I, my dad was a New York City fireman, so I was one of five, you know, Irish Catholic family in New York. And wow. firemen always had like three side gigs, and my dad had a side business where he uh, put in replacement windows. And one of his clients owned, you know, fifty brownstones in Park Slope. So when I was in high school, I helped my father on the weekends and I was in all these gorgeous brownstones in Park Slope, Brooklyn, and I had a real appreciation for real estate. And when I was, you know, with American Express, I started on the side investing in real estate and like out in the Hamptons was investing in spec houses, et cetera. And I, you know, I got a point in my career, you know, I was a vice president, I had a good job, but I just wanted something, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I got into, I, you know, I left American Express and became a real estate investor developer. And I was flipping apartments in New York and building spec houses out in the wow. Hamptons. And I, and through that process, I didn't feel like at that time, real estate brokers had strong business acumen, right? So I thought that I could do it better. And I launched a specialized brokerage at that time called Project Real Estate that was uh oriented towards dealing with investors, developers, and took a real, you know, business approach, almost like a commercial real estate broker would take to the investment side of residential real estate. And that's, so that's how I got into, you know, the real estate brokerage arena. Wow. So you started, it was called Project Real Estate? Yep. And this was your yep. brokerage and you started this brokerage and the idea was, first of all, you started on the ground with your dad. He was a builder, kind of on the side and a fireman and worked with him 50 beautiful brownstones then you become a developer now that's a pretty big that's pretty huge to step how did in the, to step into that development role how did you did you start with an investor or just small houses or how did that kind of come together well um you know i bought an apartment in the city and you know flipped it and then you know, in the, I was at a point in time where I was a young single professional and we were all renting houses out in the Hamptons in the summer. And I started to see how much money the people were renting these houses for. And then I got involved in just, you know, just looking at real estate. I'd just go out there on, we'd go out on the weekends and my friends would go to the beach and I'd go out with a realtor and look at real estate. And they're like, you know, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm just, 
I'm into it. That's awesome. And I just became, I became enamored with it, and I just sort of invested with a builder, and we built a house and flipped it and made money, and it was fun. And then it just sort of you know got me into it. Kept going. Awesome. Yeah. So you did that, and it sounds like you had maybe some not so great experiences with real estate agents that led you into this project, real estate brokerage. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, in in the real estate industry, there there are a section of the the business where it's people's chosen profession, and then there are people that do it for various reasons, whether they're moonlighting, you know, they do it as a side job, um, they do it um, because they can't get another job, so they're forced into it. Um, and when you go out into the, and this is more out in the, in the Hamptons at the time, when you're out there, a lot of people move out there for that lifestyle and they decide, well, real estate is a strong business out there. I'm going to sell real estate to support mm -hmm. myself so I can live this lifestyle. So they're not, they just don't take as professional an approach to it. And, you know, from my perspective, exactly. you know, there's always, to me, there, there's always a higher level of doing something. So you, can, you never peak, you know, there's always a high, you can always. keep going. That's why we get along so well. You can always get do it better. Um, yeah, yeah. So you started the company Project Real Estate with a focus on investors and builders. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so it was yeah highly specialized. So and tell us a little bit about how that started. How the shift from being in the development builder world to the real estate agent world. Were there any ahas for you? Were there was there or how did that go? Just give us a little bit about that story and sure. go back to I that. I mean, here's thing. how here's how it worked. I mean, number one, I, I leaned on my, you know, my 12 years of business experience at American Express um, to sort of look at the business side of this. So I was all about, you know, spreadsheets and doing investment pro formas for people. So it, it, the conversation with me was not the typical conversation that you'd have with a, with another real estate agent out there. And then I also had the experience, the direct experience from developing. So when you're talking to a developer and you've built spec houses, you, you know, it's a different conversation than if you've never done that, right? So it's yeah. almost like if I own a restaurant and I'm a chef, it's a, I'm going to have a different perspective, you know, on it because I run a restaurant, but I'm also a chef versus, you know, someone that hasn't done either and then wants to run a restaurant business. You exactly. Know what I'm saying? Exactly. So um, basically, so you, so you, so take us from there. How did you get from project? So project real estate is kind of your first step into, which is a pretty major. It wasn't like you like got your license and started trying to show people houses, um, but you went from that to I think the name of your brokerage might have changed, and then you. Um, yeah, my client, my clientele that. evolved. So what I what I did was I you know I launched it and I was servicing other investor developers in both, you know, Manhattan and the Hamptons, which are very connected. You're really dealing with the same people. Everyone that most people that have a house in the Hamptons live in Manhattan. Um, what happened was I started to, to expand my business. I sort of dipped into my wall street network, right? 12 mm -hmm. years of basically working on wall street. And I basically tapped into that network. And my business sort of morphed into dealing with sort of the high finance crowd, but using the same analytics numbers, you know, spreadsheets, uh, the type of guidance that I would give an investor. I sort of put that overlay to someone just buying, wanting to buy a summer house in the Hamptons. And that crowd was drawn to me because I sort of speak their language, if you will. Yeah, I love that. Speak so numbers. I mean, they're all just, you speak, you know, you communicate with data with these people. So you started in the Hamptons, you were representing investors and builders in the Hamptons, and then you started doing the same thing, or representing yeah. probably more of the executive homeowners in, the, in uh, Manhattan. Yeah, everything sort of emanates out of Manhattan. And, and again, it was really just speaking a, a different language to a, to a Wall Street crowd in terms, I'm all, about, um, I'm all about the numbers, the data, the statistics. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I, I sit down with someone and I don't show them beautiful pictures of a house, you know, I show them a spreadsheet and I show them how right. I've analyzed the whole market and I can tell them what the price value of that house is within 1% because I've done the analysis. You know, it's a different. That's uh, incredible. Approach. And well, that's, no, you do that for buyers and sellers, I'm assuming. Yep. That's yes. That's awesome. So tell, so tell me a little bit about, um, I want to get, I'm kind of thinking two directions with you now, but if, I want to learn a little bit more about communicating with clients. Because I think in our business, a lot of people, there's the two ends of it is it's more emotional because you're buying a home, 
But everybody always wants to use a spreadsheet or logic to justify whatever that emotion is. So you are almost approached at the opposite. You've got an emotional buyer, but you're the one who comes in and says, okay, here's your spreadsheet so you know what you're really getting. Now decide how you really feel about it. Are you, I mean, like, give us some examples of how that gives people comfort or not, or what your experience with that has been. And just give us some stories about how the first time you did that, what did the, what did your client have to say and how did they feel about it? And how did you figure out how to put these together? And Yeah, I think that for, I think, um, I think that the conversation, it just, it felt different. The feedback I was getting initially from clients was like, you're different. You think about this differently. You know, you give object, objective experience. I feel like you're standing on my side of the table. You're not trying to sell me something. You're trying to guide me through a process that you have been through. Right. right? And that's refreshing, right? And it right. makes me comfortable and it makes me trust you. So that's sort of the dialogue that I sort of created um, between myself and my clients. I would have said, Kevin, I really want this house. Just make the spreadsheet look good for what I have to pay for it. Would you just do that so I can buy what I want? <laughs> do you ever get any of that? <laughs> you know, it's interesting what I've done to a fault. If I don't, if someone might want to, a client of mine might want to actually buy something. And if I think that they're paying too much or it's the wrong, right. I'll talk them out of it. Right. You know, where I could make a nice commission because I just, I just, if it's not right for them, if the numbers don't work, you know how like people will go, it's sort of like a wealth manager or a financial advisor or a banker approach. Someone wants to pull the trigger on some impulse purchase and they call their financial advisor and they're like, no, you know, you haven't yeah. thought about this, this and this. So that's sort of my approach, which people, you get like this immediate trust thing with yeah. me and it just works for me. Exactly. So your, your, your brokerage, I think at some point, because, um, You've taken this to a whole new level at Compass, but within, was it called, because you have the private client group at Compass now, but wasn't that the name of, didn't that some somewhere along the line become the name of your brokerage? Right, so so what I did was when, um, you know, we, we we rode a high market until the market crashed out into in 2008, and and sort of when you reemerged, you know, from that in, into 2009 and beyond, um, people started to think about real estate very differently, right? Mm -hmm. uh, before 2008, um, you know, I got into real estate in 2004. And so what, for a good, right, a good so, four years, the, the market was going in one direction. And north. you had and you had the project real estate, was it project real estate group? It was project real estate. So that was in 2004? I launched that in 2004 okay. and you know, within a year and a half, like I told you, I was dealing with investors, developers, and then I started to work the Wall Street crowd. And in under two years, we did like a major deal, an oceanfront property out in the Hamptons was like $26 million. And it, and that's where this sort of my business sort of really started to get into that Wall Street crowd, private bankers and hedge fund managers and all that. And the market in New York and the Hamptons was just riding high. It was going up in the Hamptons. It was going up like 20% a year. Wow. I mean, so, yeah. you know, once the market crashed out, you know, there were people that just didn't think the real estate market could go down. Right. So it was yeah. a, so they were wanting a lot, they were wanting more of the guidance that I give more so than like the salesmanship that another broker might bring to the table. Right. right? They, wanted, they would measure five times now before they cut versus not even measuring and cutting because they just felt like a strong market growth would always just save them, even if they were overpaying for something. Oh, in two years, it's going to be worth more than this. The problem every, is everybody was thinking that. Well, there were a lot yeah. of other problems too. So, so, so when, the, yeah, go ahead. Right. So when I felt like that things were changing and the, and the conversation was changing sort of a couple of years beyond that, I, and I really started to focus then because you have to understand once the things crashed out, the investor developer sort of dried up. That business sort of dried up, right? So yeah. then I basically was really focused 100% on my Wall Street network right. and using the analytics to speak their language. So then a couple, you know, two years later, I said, you know what, I think I need to rebrand. Project Real Estate is really a brand that services developers, but now I'm servicing a high net worth Wall Street professional so right. I repositioned and rebranded it, and I and I launched a new brokerage called Private Client Realty. Oh, love that! Name. And that was in 2012. 
Okay. So that speaks more towards the, the, the approach was more like, hey, I'm like your private banker, your wealth manager, or I manage your family office, and I look at your real estate holdings like they're financial assets, and I'm going to advise you accordingly. And based on what had gone on, all the carnage in the real estate markets, especially in the high end, that was a sort of a welcome approach, and I really picked up a lot more clients with that brand and the project real estate brand that wasn't really working that hard for me because a lot of investor developers just weren't in the market. Wow. So 2012, you had already been doing it, but your private client grew or private client realty, private client realty, you start really advising and winning clients. I mean, that's, that's brilliant branding on you're taking them in. You're almost like the, which is what we should all be the real estate advisor and to treating them as the financial assets that they are and sometimes liabilities. Um, and then tell us from 2012, you kept growing this business and where did Compass come into play? Sure. So, so what happened is in, so in 2012, we had a nice, um, we had a nice run again, which sort of peaked into the end of 2015. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, when you got into the, uh, election, the presidential election cycle, Mm -hmm. things started to quiet down, certainly the high end. And, you know, New York to a large extent and the Hamptons to a lesser extent are driven, you know, there's a lot of foreign buyers that bank money, you know, in these markets. And and with the all the uncertainty around the election, a lot, you know, the foreign buyers sort of pulled back. And out in the Hamptons, um, you know, the, the, the high finance crowd wasn't making as much money and their compensation structure was changing. So, um I was really exclusively like playing in the high end, you know, mm -hmm. so, so that business oh, yeah. was changing. Right. So I had a lot of clients that really appreciated the advice that I would give, but they weren't active. So um, I got to a point where I had to pivot again in terms of not my branding, but in terms of the, the covering the full spectrum of the market. Right. right. Versus, Hey, I'm only going to sell $10 million plus. Well, guess what? If no one's buying $10 million plus, you're going to be out of business. Right, exactly. So, so to, to, in order to that kind of a pivot, so just from a transactional perspective, you know, you can do 10 to 15 transactions a year or you can do 100 to 150. I needed to have a platform to be able to, to really right. expand my bandwidth so I could service the entire market and do a volume of transactions as opposed right. to Fewer, larger. Or, or if you're Aaron Kruger, you could do 459 exactly. transactions a year. Exactly. But I, I still don't know kinda, how she's able to do that. I know. I know. Like, not to sidetrack, but I'm like, like 150 and 100 is an awful lot. I've never done that many in a year. But Aaron, Aaron I'm, I'm using that as an example. You know, no, just, I'm giving, just, I just think it's hilarious. 150 is a yeah. lot of trans. No, yeah. One person can't yeah. do, I don't, well, maybe. Yeah. Anybody out I, there doing 100 transactions on your own, message me. Just like, um, you know, the parallel is just like when my project real estate was so specialized, but that market wasn't active in terms of investor developers, my private client realty business, which was really skewed to the high end and ultra high end. You know, in 2014, right. I sold a $38 million apartment in New York, $17 million house in Greenwich. A couple of years before that, a $30 million property in the Hamptons. You know, that business largely went away. <laughs> you know, so um, I had to, well, operating with the same brand, I had to pivot and basically go after, you know, um, $3 million properties, $1 million properties. Um, one, one business I do in New York a lot now and other places is high-end rentals. So if the high-end person isn't buying, you know, they're renting. I did a, I, I recently did a right. rental in New York for $80,000 a month, you know, for example, right? So, right. Okay. Very different, you know, transaction than a, that, that would have been a $30 million apartment. Um, so exactly. I, I, I basically went in and set up a meeting with Robert Refkin, you know, at Compass. And I basically said to him, I walked in the door and said, um, my, I'm, I'm needing to pivot. Uh, you know, I'm resource constrained. I don't have the capacity to do 100 transactions. I need to come in and tap into your platform and be powered by your technology, you know, to be able to scale my private client model. And I want to take it multi-market and national 
and I want to be able, another thing was if I have clients that own four to six homes and there's not nothing going on with their primary home, which is the, the home that I'm usually dealing with, why can't I advise them on their other five homes? And a way to do that was to come to Compass and build out this team. So if I have a client in New York that wants to buy a house in uh, LA, I can do that now. You well, know, I and, can. And it also attracts those clients to work with you because they know right. that you know the agents and the net, you have the network in their other markets to make sure you've got agents in other, mar and other markets working on houses. And I'm sure you can elaborate on this, but I have to add it, is that when you've got a group of agents working together who have relationships with one another, it blows my mind how many times I talk to agents and their clients are selling in a house in California and they're going, even if they don't need to sell to buy, there's still a lot to coordinate between the two transactions and the agents have never spoken. And the no, things that it's go true. wrong when those agents aren't speaking and the recommendations that the agents in the other markets make against one another instead of for one another because there are no relationships there. But especially when we're talking about somebody with four or five, you know, ultra expensive homes, you really need to have a team of people working together for you to make sure that your transactions go smoothly in the way they should go and they coordinate. And you think about the money that you could save. But what were you going to say? Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely true. So, you know, as as an independent broker, I did have clients that wanted me to travel with them. So even so before I, I came to Compass, you know, I, I've done a lot of business in New York, obviously in the Hamptons, up in Greenwich where I live. I've helped clients in Los Angeles and Florida and the Caribbean, you know, and it was I figured out ways to do that. And I, I found brokers that I could work with. But to me, it was uncomfortable because I didn't have a rapport with brokers in these other markets and yeah, I felt which is isolated. Also a big difference. Yeah. Right. And yeah. I felt like there was this opportunity. It was just a tip of the iceberg. And I had clients asking me to help them in other markets and I wasn't equipped to do so. So that's another thing I said to Robert. I want to be equipped to do that. You know, and I think coming into Compass is a way to do that. And the other thing I was lacking was from a technological perspective. I felt like in a few years I was going to be obsolete. I was going to be viewed as an old school real estate broker right. and I needed to come into Compass and get in front of that tech technology curve so that wouldn't happen. Exactly. Exactly. Great point. So you've got the private client group. Um, tell me this, how is the private client group really changing the game of real estate and what is it doing to our profession? I think um, th there's two. I think there's two ways that that it's really changing it. And, and and again, it's always about elevating your service level. There's always. I feel like there's always. I learn every day in this business. Still, I learn on every transaction. I just think there's. I think there's a way to elevate your game every day, every week, every month, every year. And mm -hmm. I, when I sit back and I think about it. And I think about what we've sort of built here, which you're a part of, you know, at Compass is that we're a privately owned company. Now we've got, I think, 30 partners on the private client team. We, we all share the same perspective on, you know, it's all about the client and we're all guided by, you know, servicing the client at the, at the highest level. We've got a rapport. We're sharing best practices. You know, we're sharing marketing resources, et cetera. And I think now that we're all equipped to say to our respective, you know, basic clients, not only can I help you in the home market here, but I can help you in 30 luxury markets, you know, around the country. And I don't think there's another broker out there that can say the same thing, you know, because if you work for a company that has franchises and this and that, it's just not the same and, thing that we've built. And I don't think there is, I always love how I always want to disclose this isn't a Compass commercial. I made this for real estate right. agents, but of course we're at Compass. So at Compass is going to come into it and it's relevant to exactly what we're talking about. I don't think there is another real estate brokerage this big. We have, I think we have 8,000 agents. Yeah. yeah. But I don't think there's another nationwide real estate brokerage that's under one, that's actually truly one company. There's not, there's not. That's, which I, uh, which is, yeah, the other companies, it's, yeah, it's a name. I'm not even going to name names because I don't want to get myself in trouble. But right. whatever company you think of that's national, that company is owned by different people in different markets. So it's not really, you don't have the same 
you don't necessarily have the same infrastructure or you really don't have the same company. You just have the same name across right. the country. We're truly the same company and the same resources. Right. So, 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 so the bottom line is we have yeah. a team now and if, and if the client has seven homes in seven different markets in the country, one team now can service that client. Like really one for, team, not for, for, not for pretend, but for real, just saying. Yeah, no, for real, for real. Like, just saying in the ATL, for real. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and that's, and my right. clients who I've spent a lot of time with sort of educating them about this and when I sit with them and I can, and what, the other thing is, too, is I talk to you and everybody uh, week in and week out. I'm yeah. either trading emails or texts or talking on the phone to people in other markets. And now I know when I'm with my clients, they can see I know what's going on. I just was before yeah, this uh, interview, I was on the phone with a client who's a wealth manager talking about Nashville. Right. Because right. he asked me about Nashville, and I know all about Nashville. Nashville's a great market, too, by the way. Just uh, yeah. Again, Erin Kruger, we're going to be tagging her all over this interview. So that girl's in a great market, though, and a great girl. Um, but yeah, I mean, no, but you're exactly right. The other thing is, so the so that's like so servicing a client in multiple markets. And then the other thing is, if I'm going after a listing now, I, there's a private client page now in the listing pitch, and I can be in New York City, and I can tell a client, listen, I have partners in 30 other markets that can help me promote this listing in their markets. Exactly. And you know, we don't know if the buyer's coming from Aspen or Palo Alto or Miami or Atlanta. And the clients look at me and they're like, wow, that's a pretty compelling promotional capability that you've built that no other broker really has presented to me. Right? Exactly. So. Exactly. Well, because it's, it's, it's how many, the person that's going to buy the house, and I think it's different for every house in every market. And Josh Totoli, who's actually in the private client group, who we've recently interviewed in Fort Lauderdale, he does, I don't know if you know this, and maybe you do the same, but he actually goes, when he presents his analysis on the property value, part of his analysis isn't just like, here's where they are and here's what they sold for, but then he goes back and he pulls tax records and everything and he says, he pulls all the buyer names and he researches the buyers or call, I mean, I where would just call the from? agents, but where did they come from? And here's the markets, I mean, like, I'm, he's got, I wanna see that spreadsheet. But he promised me, Isaac, make sure he sends it. Anyway, but but that spreadsheet of here's where they're coming from. And here, so these are basically like, we kind of know the general feeder markets to wherever we are. Like the feeder markets to Atlanta are definitely Nashville, Asheville, Miami, LA, New York, but Dallas and Houston, Dallas for sure, Raleigh. But right. in those markets, okay, so we're gonna market to them, but where did the buyers, where, what is a track record? Like the actual track record of a home just like this one. Where did they come from? And then right. here's a direct access and resource to other agents in other markets to get the buyer in front of us. Yeah, no, it's really, you know, so again, so if it's a buyer, I can say, so say I'm talking to a buyer client that I have in New York. I can say to that buyer too, if you, if you want to go buy a house in Aspen or a condo in Miami or, you know, whatever, I can, I can help you now. Mm -hmm. where previously I really couldn't in the way I can now. And then if you're a seller, I'm like, I can get you a greater promotional reach than any other broker because I have all these partners to, to pool resources to do that, right? So those are two very, and these days it's harder to sell real estate. Um, it's harder to buy real estate. It's harder to sell real estate. It's just far more complex. And my clients now feel like I'm more resourceful to them um, across their entire portfolio of, of residential real estate. We're beforehand, not so much, you know, I could figure out how to do that, but that was very one off. And now it's like strategically together. And like, give you an example. There was someone in our town in Greenwich that literally my wife overheard a family saying they were moving to Houston. And my wife said, Oh, my husband has a partner in Houston, Caroline Bean. And I referred them to Caroline and she just sold them a, a house, you know? And so the person in Greenwich was grateful to me that I could connect them to a great, you know, broker in Houston. And I could do that from Greenwich and Caroline was appreciative of the business and it works for everybody, you know, so, exactly. the, so the concept works. Well, we've actually got Caroline putting an executive in a rental right now, which I know we all don't love rentals unless they're in New York for 80 grand, but that's going to lead her into actually representing them in a home purchase. So again, back to your point, I, um, I haven't even told you about that, but it was pretty awesome yeah. to be able to put that, that's to great. put her together. So on that, how do you, 
Because I bet everybody's thinking, okay, so you've got your group, but what about me? Do you ever have an agent, um, you know, when, when you've, you've got this group of agents and you've got this, this source of business and you've built this business, what about agents in other markets that you don't have an agent in the group or there's already an agent in the group? How do you, because I think it's really interesting and compelling how that has helped other agents. You, you don't have to be in the group to benefit from it. Um, no, no. I can tell you that we, you know, you see the, the uh, requests for referral, you know, referrals out on workplace and, and, you know, a lot of times we, I'll call that person because it's clear to me that they're, they're, do, they're going about this in a blind way. They don't, they don't know anybody in another market, right? So if, I, if, so if it's one of our markets, I'll call them up and say, listen, we've got a partner in that market. I've sort of done your work for you. I've vetted you. I've got you one of the best people in that, you know, market. Why don't you just use our person, consider using our person because I guarantee it's going to be a good experience for your client. And mm -hmm. based on the peace of mind with that, you know, we've captured a large number. So people that are not in our team within Compass still come and do business with us because they feel like pretty regularly we're the yeah. in the market. Pretty regularly. It's a, it's a great resource. It's kind of it's a great resource for people to have and for people to use. So I would love if you've got any kind of fun, crazy story of what led you to this place in your business or some really cool, crazy things or bad things that turned into great things that have happened since you've been doing business this way. You know, it's interesting. Um, I think overall, so I, I, I grew up in corporate America, right? And this is before I was married and had children, right? So I was in a I was, I had a really nice career going that, you know, wasn't super chaotic. You know, I mean, I, I was promoted regularly. So it was a, you know, yeah. Nice, nice environment to work, you know, very nice, classy American Express is a very well-run, you know, company, yeah. all that. And, um, I, I, I left that behind, you know, and, and threw myself into the world of the chaotic world of real estate. Right. Yeah. And, just when you go from working in a corporate setting to just being an entrepreneur, no matter what the industry is, the dynamic is completely different, right? So you have to almost, I mean, I owe any success I have in real estate, I owe it to my business upbringing at American Express, but you, at the same time, you have to learn how to operate completely differently, right? So it's mm -hmm. almost like the, it's almost like being street smart versus being book smart, right? So yes. I was in more of a book smart environment and then you have to get yourself into a street smart environment. And I can tell you the first couple of years into real estate, I could not believe how people in the industry operated, certain people, clients and customers, how they operated. And it took me like two years to really understand like what a dog eat dog world it was. Right. Um, right. And I think things bothered me that just don't bother me today. You know yeah. what I mean? In terms of the way, yeah. you know, someone I felt were disrespecting me or not, a, not appreciating my, my, you know, my business acumen or whatever. Um, yeah. Threw all that out the window now. And now a very thick skin, nothing bothers me. I try not to add drama to this process because there's a lot of drama and I try to be a calming influence, you know, on my clients. Exactly. And I stay, I stay focused like my blinders are on and my, my headphones are on and I just stay focused on, you know, eye on the prize, executing for the client, getting the deal done. Yeah. And just navigating that crazy landscape that is real estate. It really is. A, it's, and, and, you know, because, you know, all the personalities, every client is different. I've been involved in some really crazy situations in this business where it involves people's personal lives. And yeah. it's, it's, it's really, you get a look behind the curtain on how like a lot of people live and how they make decisions. And it's really interesting though. It really is. Isn't so it? it couldn't be more different though. And is risk. Yeah. Now I'm in a business where the, there's just a lot more risk. And now I have, you know, a wife and children. Yeah. I almost did it in the reverse. You know what I'm saying? Yes. I had the cushy job when I was single and now when I'm like the primary breadwinner, I have this, this it's very so fun. Well, and Gary V, this may be, I don't know how relevant it is, but Gary V the other day, I don't know why and how and where I saw it. Cause I don't, I love Gary V. I should follow, I, I kind of follow him, but I don't pull. But anyway, he had this whole thing about how everybody like gets out of college and gets the cush job and then they get crazy, but you're actually supposed to get crazy first, but Hey, better late than never. Right. Right. 
right? right. Because it's still a lot of fun. Yeah. But get, I, I actually yeah. feel, Jerry, I feel like knowing what I know now in real estate, if I went back to corporate America, I think I could run any company because I've seen everything. You You've understand? seen everything and you understand, you understand what it feels like to take a risk. You understand when you've had, you have failures, you feel yeah. failures. And I think in real estate, you feel it. Like in, in a job, I don't know, because I, I never could, I, I got a job and I was like, this world makes no sense to me. This seems like a lot of like silly nuances to get to silly places and nobody seems that smart here. Like nothing made sense to me in the corporate world. I was like, I'm out. I'm just going to go make money. Right. I made money, a lot more money on my own, like in high school than I was making in my first job in the corporate world. I was like, I can't do this. So I went back and became an entrepreneur, and here I am in residential yeah, real estate. Yeah, no, no, you should but, be very pr proud of yourself. Well, and, you know, I don't know um, if I, I don't know if that's thing. a good thing or a bad thing that I did that, but I could have gotten a lot out of being in a corporate job and understanding that world a little better. I got into it and it just wasn't a fit, and I got right back out. Um, yeah, but tell me, you know, when you're when you when you made that shift from world to world, and you said you said something about like I feel like now I could come back and handle anything, um, something that makes me think of, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. And I'm going to get a specific story from you out of you in a minute because we got a lot of vague examples, but I know there's a good like two or three stories in there. <laughs> it's plenty. <laughs> but I remember you know getting at, you know into this business, and you I, I like I rode horses and trained horses, and they're big and they're scary, and it was entrepreneurial, and I was like making my own money and having my own clients from very young age. But there was something about the negotiation of a real estate transaction, which it's not like it's a billion dollar transaction, but it was pretty intense and uncertain. And the emotions and the reactions of people that you'd never seen before, never expected, you're experiencing it. And as you go through it, you realize, like you said, it, you don't take, like at some point you're just like, yeah, oh wait, this isn't about me. This isn't my house. Yeah, it's my career, but I'm not, I'm, but I'm here in this moment for them, not for me. And it really gives you kind of a shift of perspective on life in general, which puts you as stressful as a job could be. It may, it's made me a better and much happier person. Um, but would you say the same thing about you on, on when you said that, like you said, you know, you've learned just to keep a steady. Yeah. You know, yeah. The difference, like in the corporate world, uh, to, to a certain extent, I felt like I was making a large company make more money. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. it was, it was something that was impersonal. I mean, I was on the client side of the business, but I had, you know, corporate big, big corporations as clients. And I just felt like, it was just very impersonal where in real estate it's very personal and there's something to me the satisfaction when you when someone says to you like thank you for you know you helped us get our dream home or you helped us sell our home we were relocating and we really needed to get that done and you really helped our family like there's just a satisfaction that comes over you that's unlike anything else that i've ever experienced in the corporate world and the connection that you get with your clients yeah and the connection well. my clients now are like friends for life and they, we've sort of been through uh, an experience together that was stressful for them. And we've bonded through that. And yeah, no, I love coming out the other side with clients. You know, you, I, I love the whole process, meeting them, listening to them, and then going out and executing for them and then going through that together, sort of hand in hand and coming out the other side and celebrating the closing. And you have this bond now. Yeah. I, you know, I really li like that process. Yeah, exactly. And then obviously thinking outside the box a little bit with things like the private client. Well, first it was private client realty, and now it's the private client group to just give yourself and give your clients more and more resources. Yeah, yeah. So now I have I have a lot more to offer in terms of people like you, I have partners. I've got Compass's technology. Exactly. You know, their platform. I just have so much more to offer. All right. So I want to know. <laughs> I don't want to know. Everybody wants to know. Give us one of your greatest either, but you got to give us details, no names. One of your greatest, what is your greatest challenge that you've overcome in your business? And it could even be just some little transaction and dealing with people and an aha you had from it or some huge deal. You know, I think you had a recent $38 million deal that you pulled off, whatever it is, how did those pieces come together and how did it look like it was going to die and it didn't. And you I mean, what a, I want some good drama. We got to have some drama. I have, you know, it's funny. One of the, one of the, um, one of the most difficult deals that I've ever done 
was recent. It closed about six weeks ago. And it was, you know, it was an estate sale and the, and uh, involving a, you know, a, a famous actress who had passed away and is dealing with her heirs. And they, they had an, a, a duplex apartment in New York and they had a, an adjoining apartment. And uh, the mom, who was the famous actress who passed away, had a friend basically living in that adjoining apartment for the last 30 years who was still there. And the heirs wow. sort of put me in play to sell everything and to sort of deal with the person who was best friends <laughs> with their mom, yeah. you know, and, and sort of moving her along and, and, you know, selling, and we were selling to another notable person whose family's a big Broadway producer family. And, and um, we got to a point in the, you know, we were in contract where the, all of a sudden, the, you know, the tenant decided that she didn't want to leave and was sort of personally offended that the heirs didn't take care of her. And the heirs were offended that the mom had let her live there for nothing for 30 years. And it was, so it got very personal on both sides yeah. and I sort of everyone involved, all the attorneys, there were attorneys, advisors, business managers, people on the body side, everyone sort of just for some reason left it to me to figure out standing in between all of these people. And the, this deal died a thousand times, but I kept at it and I kept doing creative things to sort of move the needle and pull everybody together and ultimately got it done where even like my manager in, in the New York office gave me like a 5% chance of getting closing this deal, you know, and I was, I was like, you don't so, know me. I don't like, <laughs> I'm going to close this, you know? And to me, there's always yeah. a thousand ways to get something done. And I literally pulled every trick out of my real so, estate. So program. which one worked? What's that? What worked? What did you do? Can you tell us? <laughs> I did everything from, you know, I basically, you know, part of when you're trying to get someone to move, think about someone that's lived somewhere for 30, 30 years. years. I basically yeah. took her out in a chauffeur driven car and took her to see 20 apartments and showed her, found her her next home, you know, and did that sort of in a pro bono way so that she could see where she is going, yeah. you know, and I did a lot of other things, you know, uh, to appease everybody else in the, in the transaction, so, you yeah. know, and, um, and basically just kept, just kept solving that we're, we're problem solvers in this. So every, I solved a hundred problems and I was working against a time limit too, because the buyer had called for time of essence. So we had, a, we had a, we, we really came down to the wire on closing this. Um, wow. and then, we, you know, even the closing, you know, things were happening at the closing that had to take place in order to close this, but it really, it really, it exhausted me to be honest with you, but it was, I was more proud of, you know, and it was a, a $4 million deal. So yeah. it wasn't a $40 million deal, but it was, I was more proud of what I was able to figure out to close that. And, and sometimes probably, it's just what you learn from one deal to take yeah. it to the next. I literally, yeah. exactly that. I took learnings from other deals and put it all together on this one. And you know? you're you bet you learned some on this one to take to the next one. Um, too. Yeah. And I've been, you know, I've been, uh, people get, uh, you know, I'm sort of, I've been an under the radar broker. So when I had private client realty, a lot of private minded people would get referred to me. So I've been involved in sensitive situations, if you will, like mm -hmm. finding real estate for someone who the, the husband knew he was getting divorced, but the wife did not things of, you know, things yeah. of that nature, people would yeah. come to me with real sensitive yeah. You know, and trust me that I would, you know, keep keep things confidential and quietly execute for them in a, you yeah. know, an ethical way. Everything is absolutely. ethical. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Just, you know, they certain private minded people get referred to me because they know that I just handle things quietly and professionally. And I don't ask a lot of questions, you know, you're kind of like a fixer. Most of us realtors are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, seriously, like that's what we are. We're fixers in real estate. And re Absolutely. Yeah, realtor, our, our title should be fixers in residential real estate because that is what we are. Like, Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Absolutely. All right. So I've got my final three questions. Number one, we haven't talked a lot about technology because obviously you're leaving Compass, that up to Compass. We all are. Um, they seem to have it pretty well covered, but or I should say we. 
Um, but what would you say is your, and, and it doesn't have to be technology, but your best, strongest, most beneficial tool in your business to get you where you are today and keep you growing? From a from a from a compass perspective, and to be honest, you know I've been to compass for. Well, now a this year. isn't a compass question. This is a this I is. Understand, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I okay. But, I, but I'm gonna my answer is gonna be broken down into two parts. So okay. from a from a compass perspective, um, tools like network, you know, and um, collections. I have to say, collections. I think it's a phenomenal tool, and I use collections every day, and it just is so efficient. And my yeah. clients are just so impressed with it. But it really just, in terms of, you know, we, we're dealing with so many clients and so many different transactions, the way that it just keeps the dialogue, you know, together and consistent mm -hmm. with the feedback and the shared dialogue with the with the specific All property. In one place. It's, yeah. it's really an invaluable tool. And, and a tool like network is very um, efficient for me that I can reach out to brokers that have sold recently something similar to a new listing that I'm putting on. And, and, and that's I think in, the, that's not, that's in other markets, not just your market. Yeah, that's in other markets. Yeah. And um, especially when you're Compass, selling unique properties. Yeah. And Compass Concierge is, is I think, a game changer as well. Um, outside of what Compass. What happened to one tool, Kevin? One. Now we're on all the tools. I'm giving you a hard time. Well, the one tool, the one tool inside a compass is really collections that I okay. use. Because but it's, you know what? I like this. Like, go ahead. Because concierge, for example, people don't get how awesome that one is. Well, like renovate your house for you. I mean, it's awesome. It's, it's I don't a know game, if renovate, a game, but if we get it ready. That's a game changer. That's totally. a game changer. And then I subscribe outside of compass. I subscribe to a service where I can whether I'm doing it on a map or I plug in an address, I can find out, you know, who bought something, what they paid for it, how much they owe on it, uh, you know, et cetera, um, at the touch of a button. And I use that. I use that in my business. Which one, which tool is that? It's called property shark. I, I use that in my business every day because I do a lot of off market transactions. So for example, mm -hmm. a, a buyer will come to me or be referred to me often to say, Hey, we've been looking, for something for a year and we can't find it. And we heard that you can find things like that off market. So I use that tool to approach, you know, off market owners and turn them into off market sellers. And yeah. it's, it's, it's a nationwide tool. And like, I'll give you an example and it, and it puts me ahead of like most brokers. I'll, I'll give you an example. I'm working with Emily in LA. I have a, a client in, in uh, Greenwich that wants to build a spec house in Los Angeles and Pacific mm -hmm. Palisades. And I, they, there's an off-market listing that they had brought to me, that Emily had brought to me. So I go on my property shark map, and I could tell what's going on around that property. And when I spoke to the listing broker, I knew that the two adjacent properties had recently sold and who they sold to before he did. And he's a local Los Angeles broker who has a listing. In All the right, state Isaac, right. make sure I get yeah. that out. Isaac's over there. So I knew more about him. I knew more about what was going on around the house than that broker did. From Greenwich. Wow. Because computer. we can pull tax records, but we probably can't. I guess it doesn't yeah. organize and pull it as fast. This is different. You click on a map. I can pull. So I pulled up that property on a map and I just clicked on the See, neighboring this is properties. The, so this is the kind of stuff, Kevin, like on this podcast, like I'm just going to go ahead and like be transparent. Like that stuff's so good. I'm like, do I really want to tell everybody else about that? Why right. don't we just right. keep that to ourselves? Like, no, it's, but everybody, it's you're welcome. I'm going to share it. And and Isaac is even going to give you the link for it because that's some really good stuff. That's no, it's awesome. I, I, I use it every day. And because my business is largely about giving people guidance, you know, and data and information on a market or a property or a that neighborhood. That is a good and, one. And I, and I that's that, a, a lot of my business comes from, hey, Kevin's resourceful. He can figure out anything. Just ask him. That is and a I, good one. Yeah. So, yeah. so now we're gonna. I got two more. The next okay. one. I'm dying to hear which one this is from you because I can't. I can't figure out which one it would be from you. Because um, I think you've got like two. You've read. You're. You've got this very like regimented spreadsheet calculations. Be legit logical. But there's definitely this hidden like creative guy in you. So which one? Which this is where I'm going with this. What is your book? What in the world is the book that you would recommend? You're going to crack up. I mean, I, I, 
I'm not big into sort of industry, you know, trade books and, you know, for lack of a better term, self-help. I mean, like, I, I like reading, like, John Grisham novels. I like reading, like, you know, things like that. Um, so, where you're so, Kevin, when you read the John Grisham models, I mean, books, novels, not models, novels, what are they, how do they help you sell houses? Well, to me, because they're very much, there's a situation that usually gets... Right gets intense, gets out of hand, and then there's usually an underdog in that situation that is figuring it out and perseveres through being creative and finding loopholes in the law and all those other things. And I feel like that's what I do in real estate. I love it. I, I love that. That's awesome. See, I knew whatever it was, I was like, I know it's going to be like, I don't know what it is, but it's going to be something completely different from everybody else. That's awesome. Now I want to read one. I probably have read one, but it's been a while. And um, even I'm like so watching a movie, I like difference. a movie, I like a movie where an under, and a lot of people do, like where an underdog perseveres or someone, someone stumbles onto something and has a big idea or, you know, I just like, I like how, how a simple person can sort of change the okay. world by, you know, finding a way to do it. You know what you know? that makes me think of? Have you read the book? But this goes, this is way more like mainstream for this than a, than a John Grisham, but it's John Grisham, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. But have you ever read the book um, David and Goliath by Malcolm Gladwell? Which book? David and Goliath, Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the book. That book is, that's it. It's like the underdog or what seems like the underdog is actually not the underdog. Right. The right. whole concept. You would, you, you, you would love it. Except it's a little more straightforward. It takes some of the mystery out and John Grisham puts it back in. Um, well, you know, it's funny in our business too. I mean, the, the brokerage is a large part of it, but it's a business of individuals and you can be as successful as you set your mind to be in this business, you know, you, as an individual, you know, people yes. deal with, you, uh, you know, people deal with Jerry Metcalf. So I want to deal with Jerry Metcalf because you bring something to the table that they like, you know? Exactly. Exactly. The brokerage is just part of what we bring to the table. It's not, yeah. you're exactly right. That's what's so much fun about it. And with working with one another in this business. Um, exactly. Last question. If there's one thing that you hope we take away from this interview, what would that be? One thing that I take away? No, the listeners, me and everybody listening. What's the one thing you want to make sure we get out of this? You know, I, 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 I want everyone to know that um, real estate's a difficult business. And if you're a, if you're a buyer and a seller out there, um, get yourself the best broker that you can. I mean, most, most of us, we all work hard, but, you know, get the broker that you think provides you the most objective, honest, you know, well thought out sort of advice. And if you're a, if you're a broker out there and let's say, for example, you're just starting out in this business, um, the business has changed. It's being, you know, you know it's being disrupted from, you know, all sides. Um, the, the markets are more dynamic. They go up, they go down, they slide sideways, people move, the tax laws change. If you're young in this business, get on a team with someone experienced and just be a sponge and learn from them because you learn by doing in this business. You can't read a book on how to be a successful real estate broker. You have to do the deals and put in the time and it takes time. You can't do, you can't accelerate it. You have to, you have to put in the time, go work for someone that you can learn from and then specialize in what you think is going to set you apart from the competition and drill down on that. That was awesome. I love that about specializing what will differentiate you. I think that's the biggest thing people miss is they just want to take, they just want to sell houses to everybody they know. And yeah, that's like, I'm going to be a doctor thing, so I can do thing. like surgery on everybody I know. It does not work that way. And real estate is just as serious. It's just as it, important that you're a good real estate agent and the right kind of real estate agent as it is a doctor. Boy, no, you have to imagine a, an elevator conversation. If someone asks you in an elevator between the first floor and the 20th floor, what sets you apart as a real estate broker? You know, I'll say to them, I'm a, I'm a business person that happens to sell real estate. You know, I'm not a salesperson. I'm a business person that happens to sell real estate. And that's what sets me apart. You know, so you have to have your elevator pitch. Can I steal? Answer. Can I take that one? I'm just going to take it. You mind? <laughs> I like that one. That's good. I'm a podcaster that happens feel, to say, Isaac, edit easy. that out, Isaac. Don't edit it out. Feel that's pretty like, easy. Right? I like the business person. I'm killing Isaac now. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
Uh, yes, I love that. They, really, that is what it is. And that's what real estate agents are becoming in this in the today's age, um, which I think is so great. And Compass is definitely helping that happen and people like you. So, well, Kevin, thank you for being on the show.